Welcome to the Sensible Socialist Podcast, a podcast for the rational left. We need to unite and work together if we're all going to get through this. Sounds like socialism to me. The amount of people I see talking about socialism positively is actually staggering. Do you think, we, I mean, do you really think that, we, that a, a proletarian revolution is just around the corner in America? Grab your pitchforks and stab your mayor. Little hero Obama. He's not my hero. How heroic he does Trump. <laughs> if Bernie Sanders were president, right, and he wanted to bring the same ideas as social, for socialism into this country, don't, do you think that we would benefit? I just told you Venezuela is eating rats. But I just want people to have health care. I don't want, like... <laughs> well, Same thing Hugo Chavez. Oh my god. You people know? have, like, worms in your brain, honestly. Alright, welcome to this week's episode of the Sensible Socialist Podcast. Uh, apologies for not having an episode last week. Uh, I was uh, originally planning on doing an episode about the uh, the Gilets Jaunes, the protests that are happening in France, but the events just kept going, and uh, and they really uh, haven't stopped. So I still do plan on doing an episode on that, but um, I really didn't have anything to put in its place or anything like that, and so um, so I, I missed a week. So sorry about that. But uh, this week we are, I'm going to present uh, the audio from an event that I uh, helped co-sponsor or was, was part of doing. Uh, this is a discussion with Michael Peck. Michael Peck is the U.S. delegate from Mondragon. Uh, since 2000, he's the North American delegate for Mondragon. And you know, if you don't know what Mondragon is, it's, it's the world's largest industrial worker co-op. Uh, at in 2013, its USA sales were 250 million dollars. So um, in 2012, Michael Peck uh, with the United Steelworkers Union um, and cooperation with Mondragon and the Ohio Employee Ownership Center announced the union co-op template uh, to create worker-owner hybrid projects and businesses with the goal of revamping U.S. manufacturing through worker empowerment and ownership. Which I thought was a, a, it's just a great idea. And so uh, in, in 2014, Michael helped launch the nonprofit One Worker, One Vote. You can find that at oneworkeronevote.org. Uh, and it's dedicated to solving America's unhealthy and unequal opportunity, mobility, and wealth divides through a broad based equal share worker ownership kind of system. So it's now operating in more than 11 US municipalities and in varying development stages. So just a note on this, uh, this audio was taken from an event that we hosted, basically talking about Mondragon cooperatives, and uh, the event was, was put on by Democracy at Work DC. If you're interested in learning more, check out democracyatworkdc.com, and you can see some of the things that we're, that we're doing. Um, but there were some uh, questions and some back and forth, but the audio really didn't pick it up that great. So what I'm going to do is basically just jump in and kind of... Um, ask the questions so that it's it's audible and then you can hear uh, Michael's response. So when you hear me come in, uh, it's not necessarily my question, but it's the question that was asked of Michael Peck. So uh, without further ado, here is Michael Peck. Well, first of all, thank you all for being here. Snart, thank you for getting such a good group here. I would have come just for one of you, but the fact that you're all here, it's like a bonus. Um, so I'm going to not talk so much and spend most of the time on questions because most people have questions and a dialogue is so much better than a monologue. Um, in this town, we always have to face people sitting up and talking to us. It's kind of a pain. Um, so I just want to tell you a few things. One, um, the, f the number one phrase we have at Mondragon is, this is not paradise and we are not angels. I'm translating from the Basque, but um, it's important because we get 4,000 industrial tourists annually, whether we want them or not. And um, people are just amazed uh, that they see working class, blue collar people, um, you know, making things. Um, and... Uh, uh, they give back to their society, and there's no McMansions on the hill, but there's no homeless in the streets. You have a rising working class, but it's not perfect, 
it's not nirvana. We, we make plenty of mistakes. We usually do it in public, and then other people from other countries write about it, get their PhDs. <laughs> <laughs> so how many people here don't know the Monogon story? OK, two, three. All right. So I'll give you the Americanized, the Americanized version of it. So how many people have seen Pablo Picasso's Guernica picture? OK. And you all know what that's about, right? So the Basque people, it's a 2,000-year-old culture. Uh, they have their own language, their unique history. Um, as always, when you're a unique people with a language that can't be traced to every, anything else, people are quite ready to stereotype you and typecast you. So, you know, people who are not Basque say, oh, well, the Basques, they have a special blood type. Their heads are a little larger. All these things that we do with people that don't look like us. None of that's true. But, but the language is untraceable. Um, I sometimes think it sounds like Japanese, but of course I don't speak Japanese. Um, but it sounds, it is untraceable. So I'll just give you an example. The word for drizzle in Basque is shirimiri. I love that because I think shirimiri sounds so much better than drizzle, right? <laughs> right. So the Basque region, 2.2 million people. They have about 35 to 40 percent of Spain's industrial capacity, which is quite an amazing statistic. Um, they compete against everybody. They compete against the Germans in engineering, the Italians in design. They're one of the most prosperous areas of Europe. Um, you know, Spain is, well, the 2008 Great Recession, Spain hit 27 percent unemployment, 50 percent for people 30 and younger. Basque region topped it out, maybe nine. Percent Mondragon, which always had zero percent unemployment, because in Mondragon our primary goal is employment creation. Um, we were at four percent; that was considered heretical. Um, but that was in the Basque region is divided into three provinces: Vizcaya, Guipuzcoa, and Donasteria, where San Sebastian is. Um, and Mondragon uh, has about 105 cooperatives about 240 organizations altogether in the group. But just to give you some context, the Basque region has 1,300 cooperatives. So less than 10% are in Mondragon. And that's interesting. But it also explains the solidarity uh, in the Basque region. And solidarity, you know, I was talking to the vice president for international from the Guggenheim Museum. We have quite an interesting Guggenheim Museum in, uh, in Bilbao, um, the titanium was shaped by Mondragon, by the way. Um, and he was saying that the, the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao is completely different than any other Guggenheim Museum anywhere else in the world because it's had this huge impact on economic development. I mean, Bilbao was like Pittsburgh before Pittsburgh got transformed. And I don't mean transformed culturally because Pittsburgh is still working on its cultural transformation. I mean, minority communities in Pittsburgh are still some of the most left behind of any minority communities in the United States in any city. But it did go from a, a Rust Belt uh, dying industry town, Bilbao, to something that now is, it's, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, an, it's an equality mecca. It's a lifestyle mecca. It's a cultural mecca that started with the Guggenheim Museum, showing that, you know, we've learned in the United States the hard way over the past, uh, well, definitely two years, that everything is downstream from culture, politics, economics. And in Bilbao, they proved that if you invested 2.3 million euros in a museum, you could transform the entire city. They went from the museum to a tram to, now they're cleaning up the river. Um, and it's, it's got a really integrated architecture. They're focused on living spaces, um, iconic buildings. It's quite amazing when you go there. So Mondragon, so you, back to Pablo Picasso's you know, painting of Guernica. So, so the Basque region, they kind of lost twice. They lost in the Spanish Civil War. They were on the losing side. Um, they represented the, the uh, democratically elected government, as the Catalans did also. But the nationalists under Franco won. And it was the second time the Moors invent, uh, invaded Spain. You know, the Moors invaded Spain 
uh, for 700 years. And then Franco used the Army of Africa to help him win the Spanish Civil War. So we always refer to that as the second Moorish invasion um, of Spain. And uh, the Basque lost. And then they lost again during World War II because Spain was, you know, officially neutral, but Franco was clearly on the side of Mussolini and Hitler. And that's why Guernica, you know, they allowed the, the German and Italian um, aircraft to strafe the town for target practice. That's what that painting is about. Um, a gratuitous gesture. With, and Guernica was an interesting place because Guernica has the tree, the Basque Liberty Tree. It's, the, it's where the Lendicati, which is the president of the Basque um, people, officially goes to that tree and swears that oath for 2,000 years to the culture and the people and the democratic principles. Um, so they chose that town to strafe because of its democratic significance. So in between all of that, a little, a little village with 25,000 people in the middle of the mountains was pretty much reduced to rubble in the 40s. I mean, it had cholera, famine, over 50% unemployment, maybe 85% unemployment. And so the village priest arrived. Um, he took one look and left. And then the substitute village priest arrived uh, on a bicycle, blinded one eye. His name was Father Jose Maria Arith Mendireta. Took me 10 years to figure out how to say that. <laughs> Ho Jose Maria Arith Mendireta. And, you know, we live in America, which is, you know, add water and stir, instant everything. What have you done for me lately? Why isn't, why isn't the miracle already happened so I can go to the next miracle? We don't, we don't quite recall that Jose Maria, I'll just do that for short, or Father Arith Mendireta. It, 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 took him, it took him 15 years, 15 years of, of preaching um, and showing, not telling. Remember English 101, your English teacher said show, not tell. Uh, that's how you write well. Um, showing why cooperation, collaboration was the key to cultural success. He did that by organizing soccer games, football games, because sports was a way to break through. And finally, he created this little school, little technical school, and five engineers graduated. And they, and they decided to form a cooperative uh, to make kerosene stoves. And so the priest went down to Franco's Madrid and asked for um, Social Security. And of course, they denied it because it was a cooperative, neither you know, vegetable, fish, or fowl. No one knew. So that led him to create his own mutual, which is now called Lagonoro. And then um, when the cooperative grew to another cooperative, because remember, Mondragon is organic. It's bottom up. It's not top down. Anybody who does something top down in economic development and tells you that they're following the Mondragon approach is smoking dope. It's just <laughs> not true. So uh, he tried to get loans to grow. And of course, the bank said no. So that led him to form his own bank. So if we fast forward, oh. And then, you know, after 45 you know, cooperatives were successful and profitable, and here's another point. In Mondragon, you know, we believe in profitability. When I started this 19 years ago, I used to walk into fairly progressive audiences, willingly, and, um, and I'd say, you know, we need to be profitable, and half the people would get up and leave. Um, well, aren't you here to overthrow capitalism? No, I'm actually not here to overthrow capitalism. Um, I think you can have an enterprise that's lean but not mean, which is a Mondragon cooperative. Um, so we call it virtuous cycle capitalism as opposed to predatory capitalism. Um, but we believe in being profitable in everything. Nonprofits have to be profitable also. And why do we believe in being profitable? Because the secret to success, to independence, self-actuation, self-realization, is being able to afford your own values. That's the key phrase, being able to afford your own values. If you don't like walking around with a tin cup, be profitable. So we had about 45 profitable cooperatives from, let's say, 53 when the first cooperative started, that little kerosene stove. And then in 93, we decided, well, I guess we should, you know, we should, we should group up and form Mondragon. So, so 40 years. 
40 years, you know, compare that, and I won't mention the city because I take them on all the time, it's not fair, but, you know, some cities have gotten a lot of money and started a cooperative, and the first thing they do is they fix the box at the top because that way everybody gets paid, everybody knows what's going on, then they trickle down the enterprise to the people, and they say they're inspired by Mondragon, that's the exact opposite of Mondragon. Mondragon has 50 people in its headquarters for a $16 billion enterprise. And they're trying, to, they're trying to hollow that out. I mean, Mondragon is all about spin it out, spin it out, spin it out, form another cooperative, give, give authority to the people that, you, anybody who welcomes it. Um, which is why we have, you know, six salary levels between the lowest and the highest paid. Because we believe in wage solidarity. We have 10 principles. The cooperative movement, as you know, has seven. We had three, we had three more. Two of them I particularly like. One is that labor is sovereign. And the next one, capital or finance, while necessary, is uh, of service to labor. Capital is of service to labor. Finance is of service to labor. I mean, try, try making that argument in front of a Wall Street bank. We don't do that because that would be an exercise in futility. But what we tell the Wall Street banks are is that we now have proof, documented proof in this country, the U.S., that we can compete more or less with uh, virtually integrated companies when the graphs are going great and everybody's smiling. But when the graphs are going downstream, we compete much better because worker-owned enterprises are much more resilient. They're more productive. They hang on to their people. They get to live to fight another day. They get to buy time uh, because their decisions are local and they're co-owned equally by all the people in the enterprise. And it's amazing what people will do if they know they have another day to figure it out. So fast forward, you know, Mondragon now, it's about almost 70 years since it first started. The, the little school is now a university, Mondragon University, with about 4,000 students. It's a cooperative university. It's owned equally by the students, the teachers, the parents of the students, and the cooperatives that hire the students. It's a nice, you know, nice virtual ecosystem. Um, you can get an MBA from Mondragon University. Uh, they have equal numbers of men and women getting engineering degrees. But they've learned that men and women like different kinds of engineering, so they've figured that out. Um, the bank is now called, it used to be called Caja Laboral, but in 2008, uh, the Great Recession, which was a disease born in this country, got, you know, exported overseas, and Spain uh, got hit pretty hard because in the Spanish economy, at that time, um, construction was 10% of the GMP, tourism was another 10% of the GMP. Um, if you made something for the construction industry, you sort of stopped dead in its tracks. I'll get to that in your tracks. I'll get to that later. So the bank, uh, Labra, uh, Caja Labral, was no problems, no bad real estate portfolio, no fake loans, no nothing weird. And because it was so good, uh, the, the Bank of Spain said, we're going to eliminate half of the savings and loans, and you get to merge with another one. Um, so they merged with Kucha Bank in the Basque region, and now called Labro Kucha. Last year, they won the, the number one customer service award for, for all Spanish banks. Not a big bank, $60 billion bank. But. So the university, the bank, the insurance mutual, Lago Noro is about an $8 billion fund. Um, you know, we didn't escape unscathed from the Great Recession. As everybody knows, uh, our... Our, that little kerosene stove cooperative grew out to become Fagor, which became one of the largest electric white, uh, white goods producer in Spain. You know, kitchens, baths. Oh, about a $2.2 billion cooperative with about 30, 28% to 29% of market share in Spain, where all its profit margins were. But in a mature industry, so that when it competed overseas against lower cost economies, it had to compete in, at cost. So when the, the Spanish construction sector stopped because of the Great Recession, because no one was building homes, and obviously no one was buying kitchens and bathrooms, so the profit from Fagor kind of disappeared. Its margin disappeared in Spain. 
And so because it was the first cooperative, because we had an emotional attachment to it, which was a mistake, and because most of the leaders, all the leaders, I would say, came from our first cooperative. And this cooperative had spun off other cooperatives, which had spun off other cooperatives. So we had a Fagor Ederlan that made car parts. We had a Fagor Electronica, which did electric logistic, uh, supply chain logistics systems. And we had all these other spin-offs. So this huge institutional community loyalty, we kept bailing it out. Um, we bailed it out to the term, terms of maybe the tune of maybe 300 million euros over five years. They, they uh, presented the last Sanimento cleaning, clean up the balance sheet um, in uh, 2000, say 11, um, for 167 million euros. I may be wrong on the date there. But Mondragon voted unanimously no, and no one expected that. It's the first time it really happened. And so the whole system was like a deer caught in the headlights. That had never happened to us before. Of course, you know, the economist said, ah, Mondragon, failure in Cooperative Valley, can't scale, can't weather the recession. I mean, Fagor had been a viable industry for almost 60 years, but didn't talk about that. Um, the Wall Street Journal took a crack at it. Um, but in reality, what happened was quite amazing. Um, there were 2,000 people on the streets. Uh, and so what did we do? Well, Lago Noro, our insurance mutual, um, kicked in. Um, so everybody was first put on 85% salary uh, and benefits. Um, and within six months, we had cross-trained 1,500 of those 2,000 people and placed them in other cooperative industries in Mondragon. Um, hundred and something people took early retirement. Um, and so basically right now there's about 50 people that haven't been placed over the years. And that's an amazing thing. I mean, you can go on YouTube and, and you know, since the U.S. signed NAFTA in 92, we've lost over 61,000 factories. A lot of those factories, when the factories got dismantled, they did YouTube pieces. I'm affiliated with the Steelworkers Union. We did a lot of those. And there's not a single factory in this country that was dismantled where anything close to that happened. What happens in this country is we make a zero-sum decision. It's a financial decision because we arbitrage and commodify labor. So what happens is the factory goods get bundled up and exported to whoever bought them, and the labor, the human resource, gets uh, tossed to the wind, told to go fish, and you lose a generation of that particular skill set in their DNA. Um, and uh, you, try to, you try to solve it with, um, with you know, Burger King and service sector jobs, and it just doesn't work. And the business schools in this country preach creative destruction, but nobody talks about those who were creatively destroyed, and no one talks about uh, creative reconstruction. I mean, I don't understand why creative destruction is such an art form for business schools and creative reconstruction doesn't quite hit the books. But it should. I mean, if you believe in Newton's second law, what goes this way must be equal to that way. But we don't have it. And so what happens is that all these people lie fallow wherever their dead factories are, and they grow up and become Trump voters. And then you see the problems we have. So it all comes home to... And those of us who worked in the Gephardt campaign in 88, where we actually said that trade packs that we were negotiating were wrong, and people said, oh, you free, anti-free traders. We weren't anti-free traders. We were just, you know, looking out for workers on the home front. I mean, so Mondragon, uh, back to Mondragon. Uh, so they, you know, they have this example where they've course, course corrected. They've absorbed their lumps. They've learned how to innovate. We have 12 technology centers. We have over 900 patents. We spend about 6% of our profits on, on R&D. There's a lot of reasons for that. The Basques historically are the metal benders of the world. The famous sort of Toledo in Spain was made in the Basque region. <laughs> so we're also the good shields and the plowshares. And the Industrial Revolution started there and also in Barcelona. With Barcelona it was textiles. In Bilbao it was manufacturing. So you could say that the Basques have manufacturing in their DNA, although you know, that's a stereotypical statement, but still, it's one success of factory after another making things. And how do they stay relevant? They invest profits back into their factory. And I'll give you a perfect example. There's a Mondragon uh, cooperative called Areca. 
and they make the basic bolt, you know, the bolt, manufacturing bolt that you bolt onto a, let's say, a wind turbine platform, right? Well, somebody came along with the, uh, with the bright idea, if you have this bolt and it's located on an offshore wind turbine platform or an offshore oil platform, uh, the amount people spend trying to make sure those bolts are tight uh, and those, you know, climate insecurity type environments, well, that's an expensive, just the insurance alone is expensive. So they have a sensor to it. They call it an eye bolt. And now they can manage the bolts from, you know, 2,000 miles away with an iPad. That's it. That's the kind of innovation that happens at Mondragon. Um, and it happens year after year after year. Like I said previously, we compete against the Germans in engineering and the Italians in design. And we do it with cooperatives. And we do it with six salary levels. And we do it with the principle of one worker, one vote. And we do it with the General Assembly, where 20% of us can fire our CEO if we don't like him or her. Um, and um, the day-to-day -day decisions, and people have this funny idea about cooperatives. They think it's, you know, it's uh, kibbutz, it's, you know, kumbaya, it's something that begins with a K. <laughs> um, but in reality, it's a competitive industry that, again, is lean but not mean. It has a CEO, a CFO, a chief marketing officer, and what other chiefs they need to be functional. It just does a whole lot better for workers in terms of sharing the profits equitably. And so, you know, one worker, one vote. Nobody's vote is bigger than anybody else's vote. Nobody's share is more than anybody else's share. When you come into a Mondragon cooperative, uh, right now the price is about 18,000 euros. So let's say you're a young person, you come in. <clears throat> I didn't have 18,000 euros. I still don't have 18,000 euros. But the people, uh, what they do is they range a loan with our bank and they get to pay it over their paychecks, you know, three years or whatever it takes, then they own their share. That if your cooperative is profitable, that a share accumulates value, accumulates value. When you retire at age 65, that's the mandatory retirement age, uh, you have, you own your house probably already, um, and you have a middle class retirement um, that is honorable. Yes, sir. What's the lowest salary level? So it depends on the industry because, you know, we have a huge variety of industries in Mondragon. Mondragon is highly diversified, and um, uh, that's c one of the secrets of our success is that when some industries are going on a downturn, other industries are going up. But I would say that, and I'm, gonna, I'm answering your question just kind of in a roundabout way, I would say that we have a, a huge manufacturing industrial sector, a huge retail sector. We're the second or third largest retail um, operation in Spain and we have a financial sector and a knowledge sector. And each one of those have different salary levels. But in those sectors, there's the six differences between them. And people say, well, you know, that must discourage, uh, you know, being, you know, entrepreneurial or incentives. And as we say in Spanish, ni hablar, no way. Um, because, uh, matter of fact, uh, people are there, uh, they're very competitive. They, they, you'll, you'll find people working on the weekends, and when you ask them, they say it's because it's my business, which is true, it is their business. Um, the decisions are made within each cooperative. They're fairly autonomous. The mothership provides certain things like, you know, HR, IT, um, um, an R&D fund. Um, everybody contributes equally a percentage of their profits to uh, the welfare of the group, to um, to common uh, functions like, like, you know, education and so forth, and also giving back to society, and, um, and it works. And if you talk to the people that are at, on the leadership levels now, um, they'll tell you that they got this project from their, their fathers and mothers, their parents, and it's their obligation to leave a project in better hands than they got it for their children and their children's children. And that's actually a real answer. It's not a Hollywood meet cute answer. It's actually what people say. And they're serious about it. So we learned that, you know, the question that we're spiritually unable to answer in this country, which is how much is enough? I mean, people are just incapable of answering that question or even conceiving that question. That question is already answered. Um, and it turns out that, you know, enough is something much lower than you think it will be. And when you work in a group with solidarity and values, uh, you find that if everybody's thinking about you, you no longer just have to think about yourself.
do people just have one share and then that, that share increases in value or how does that work? One worker, one vote. For example, our most profitable co-op now is our elevator co-op called Arona. You should go, if you're ever near San Sebastian, go to the Arona building. They've made one of these future bu futuristic buildings. Um, and they also have a very cool foundation. Um, and, uh, you know, they've, they've amassed this incredible operation. Only, it's only operating in Europe. Um, so what happens at the end of the year, the worker owners, meaning everybody, um, they get to decide what to do with the profits. So part of it may go to a joint venture, part of it may go to R&D. And when it comes down to salary, you know, we don't have a salary, we take an advance against profits. So at the end of the year, when you do the books, if there's more left over than you advanced, then people get to vote about how to distribute it. So if you had a good year and you think you're set for next year and you're not worried, you may vote to give yourself a bonus. Um, meanwhile, your share is increasing over time. Um, and when it's time to leave, uh, you take your share with you. But you don't have to. A lot of people in Mondragon leave their share in the corporation because <laughs> the corporation's been paying 7% interest on it, which is not sort of unheard of in the whole world right now. The corporation will pay, if you leave your share value in the, in the cooperative, even though you're retired, um, because you want to continue to invest where you spent your working life, uh, you get interest on that. And that interest is usually at a pretty good rate. To encourage people to do that, actually, because the more, remember, we can't go to the stock market. Uh, we are, you know, between a, a 14 and a $16 billion enterprise, uh, depending on the exchange rate. And we fund ourselves and we have our bank, but after, after the 2008 Great Recession, you know, only 5% of the bank's profits can be used to fund Mondragon as opposed to the old days, and that's the Bank of Spain rules now. So we really have to use our own uh, profit-making ability uh, to find capital for our expansion, and it's one of our big challenges uh, as we go forward. Because, for example, we, we have a 2.2 billion euro automotive parts group. Um, hard to find a car that doesn't have a, a Mondragon part. But we're all over the world. You know, we're in like 150 countries with productive plants. And we don't go there because we woke up one day and had a, I just think I'll, you know, set up a plant in Brazil. We go there because the OEM, the original manufacturer, says, if you want the business, you need to have a plant where I'm going to build the so-and-so. And you have to be there at your own cost and invest. And, you know, hopefully it pays off. So that's why we're kind of all over the place. We have 19... Uh, product, uh, production plants in China. We're the largest Spanish multinational in China. And right now there's, uh, there's officially four Mondragon global delegates. There's one in Russia, one in China, one in India, and me uh, here. Um, and the role of the delegate is, uh, is not to do the speech. Um, uh, it is to represent all of Mondragon. Um, it's easy for me because I drank the Kool-Aid a long time ago, but um, you know, you help out commercially and you're not a lobbyist, you're a business development person, but you also represent the values of the enterprise to the best of your ability. So one of my uh, opening remarks um, before you got here was our number one saying in Mondragon is, this is not paradise and we are not perfect. Um, you know, sometimes people hold you, you try to do something good or something that's good for people. Um, and people think, wow, you, you're at that level. So then they, then they sort of think you're going to be perfect in every way. We're definitely not perfect in every way. We're composed of human beings who are by definition not perfect. Um, but we do have a robust system of values and practices that have helped us perfect our union um, over the past 60 some odd years. And um, we, we can draw upon that, even though, you know, we'll be learning a lot as we embrace the new challenges of the future, like AI and ro robots everywhere. The same thing that everybody confronts. Now I want to get to your question. So, um, there's an organization that uh, Sinar mentioned I'm part of called the American Sustainable Business Council, ASBC. Their membership is 250,000 triple bottom line businesses, so people, planet, profit. They're a nonprofit. They're a C3 and a C6, so they can lobby. And we have a campaign called Ownership for All. You should hook up with them and um, um, lend your talents. 
Sir, can you give us a little bit of a, a background about the, the organizational structure? And I mean, you said one worker, one vote, but what are the decisions that they're actually voting on? Are these strategic decisions? Are they are they day-to-day -day decisions? What is the way that the organization actually sort of functions? So a worker cooperative, Mondragon style, there's a general assembly. The general assembly elects the CEO. The CEO then decides who will be his or her management. So chief marketing officer, chief technology officer, whatever roles and functions are needed for the day-to-day -day functioning of the cooperative. So day-to-day -day decisions are made by the management team. The management team has to report back uh, to the board of the cooperative, which is also elected by the General Assembly, and they have to make the plan that they promised everybody. If they don't make the plan, they can be removed. If 20% of the workers in an enterprise think they should replace their CEO, they can vote and do that. Um, the strategic decisions are made by the General Assembly, and the day-to-day -day decisions are made by uh, the management. So you have, you have this back and forth going. Uh, but the other thing about um, a worker cooperative is that you have a high degree of financial literacy uh, because everybody has to know everything to have an informed vote. So if you ask anybody, you know, what are the strategic profit loss projections? What are the margins? Um, what was the last investment about? Uh, from the worker entering the shop floor to uh, someone you know, in a management position, uh, they'll probably be able to tell you. Another, another interesting characteristic of cooperatives in Mondragon is that we believe in, in redundant structure. You know, to the point, you know, if Attila the Hun came and ran your cooperative with a redundant structure, he probably couldn't screw it up. Um, we haven't had Attila the Hun yet, so this is a suppositional example. Uh, but uh, what I'm trying to say is that we have something called a social committee. A social committee is, um, for cooperatives that are 50 people and above, a social committee is if you can't get everything uh, decided in a one worker, one vote democratic framework, if you, uh, if for some reason, um, you know, the, all the processes don't work, you can then take your problem right to the top and hopefully get it solved. When we formed the union co-op model in 2000, between 2009 and 2012, because it took us a while, uh, we slid out the social uh, committee tray and we slid in the cooperative agreement tray. And it's worked pretty well. Um, we, we're working with over 30 uh, unions in our movement and um, there's collective bargaining agreements all over the place. Um, so, do you want me to talk a little bit about what we're doing in the U.S. or would you like to ask me questions? Okay, so um, NCBA CLUSA is well represented here. Uh, they are the trade association that represents all cooperatives in the United States. Um, and they do an amazing job. Um, my organization is called One Worker, One Vote. We're 501c3, registered in the state of New York, One Worker, One Vote, with a number one. So number one worker, one vote. Um, we have a Facebook page you can visit us on, and we have a site. Um, and we're highly distributed, just like Mondragon. Um, very little in the headquarters, everything out in the field. Uh, we were started uh, with a collaboration between the United Steelworkers Union and Mondragon. That happened in 2009. It was a historic agreement. The first time the steelworkers had affiliated with a, a cooperative group and the first time, and I think only time, Mondragon's ever done anything with the union. Certainly in Spain, nothing, but here they did it. They actually, the two organizations had a lot in common. The steelworkers are the largest manufacturing union in North America, and um, they have a lot of the same principles or practices, and they were staring into the abyss of what happened in the 2008 Great Recession, and we knew we had to do something great. The steelworkers, to this day, have a visionary labor, uh, labor union leader. His name is Leo Gerard. He's the real deal. Um, he's the one who teamed up with the uh, Sierra Club to form the Apollo Alliance and then the Blue-Green Alliance. He brought all the unions and the environmentalists together and said that the choice between a good job and a clean job is a Hobbesian choice and you don't have to make it because you can have both. So he's always been way 
way, thinking way beyond the box. And um, we exist because of, in large part, because of his vision. And also he had vision uh, within Mondragon as well to allow us to, you know, begin this experiment here in the United States. Um, so um, in 2012, uh, we announced the Union Co-op template. Uh, at the atrium of the Steelworkers headquarters in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. A lot of the leaders of the U.S. cooperative movement showed up. It was good solidarity. And then uh, in Cincinnati, a group of amazing people, four amazing people. One was um, a Catholic uh, peace justice worker. Another one was an undocumented uh, worker from, uh, from Peru. Another one was a young labor organizer. She represented the U.S. food and commercial worker, and she was tough as they come. Um, and the other one was a retired uh, railway um, uh, engineer, uh, head of his union with stage four Parkinson's. So these four people came together and they created something called the Cincinnati Union Cooperative Initiative. So this is one of the most exciting things to happen in the union co-op movement. There's now six profitable union co-ops. Uh, we have uh, a food desert store called Our Harvest Cooperative. We have, um, a, a, sorry, we have an urban farm called Our, Our Harvest Cooperative. We have a energy efficiency um, cooperative called Sustainergy, a union cooperative called Sustainergy. Um, it goes around and decarbonizes or lowers the carbon footprint, uh, first with insulation, later with other techniques, and you pay for it uh, out of the savings from your energy bill. Um, we have something called renting partnerships that I'll, I'll answer your question you haven't asked me yet. Um, renting partnerships uh, is something uh, uh, set up by two amazing ladies um, where you have a formula for transitioning public housing to cooperative housing. Uh, they did the work um, showing that the high cost of public housing is turnover. So they constructed a series of points uh, three things you have to do. You have to hold meetings. You have to uh, stay in, your, stay in your, your, your unit. A whole series of things you have to do. You, over five years, you get enough um, for a down payment on the unit, which you can then make. They have a connection with the bank. Once you do that, that particular unit is converted, and they then get to the whole housing structure. At the end of time, the residents have moved from um, from being on public housing to be a cooperative housing. And you can look at renting partnerships, you can Google it. Um, it's really interesting what they've done. Um, there's a lot of uh, programs that are now in place around the country to take a stab at affordable, at sustainable housing. Um, in Cincinnati, we're practicing one of them called renting partnerships, but there's community land trusts and there's, but it is a huge topic to address in this country. And it goes, it's very tightly connected to um, um, gentrification and also redlining in cities and then all the injustices, environmental injustice, neighborhood injustice. You can just go down the list. The list is endless, unfortunately. Housing is at the heartbeat of it. Um, you know, we all have seen the study uh, for people of color in 2050. I think their savings rate is supposed to be zero because of that kind of injustice. So, you know, a lot of people paid their bills because of the rising uh, value of their house because they were able to get a mortgage and they were able to get a home equity. That, that is a privilege that unfortunately is not extended to everybody. So um, there is an awful lot of work. It's a fundamental defect in this country. Uh, I'm not saying that in Cincinnati we've answered the whole thing. We've just done one program. It's pretty cool. Uh, I think it works, it, it's, it's converted. Public, house, uh, uh, public housing to cooperative housing. Cooperative housing is important um, because people own their units. They have equity, they own their units, and home ownership is the same thing as, you know, there's an old saying that nobody washes a rental car. Um, and there's a reason for that, right? So what kind of buy-in did you need from the municipality and from organizations, and including governmental organizations like HUD and, and other, how, how did you navigate that dynamic? The reason why Cincinnati works is because they've created an ecosystem. The reason why Mondragon works is because it's an ecosystem. In this country, we get all excited about one-off announcements. Somebody does something great, 
and get very excited about it. Press release, fanfare. But then we realize that a standalone has to stand alone. <laughs> and what makes Mondragon work is that we can move capital and labor between 240 different organizations within any given year. And if your number one example is the creation of sustaining family and community sustaining employment, that is the way you do that. That is, that is why, in e that's why we always talk about, don't just start a worker cooperative, start a worker cooperative, but start it within the framework of an ecosystem. And think about what you do, um, how it could relate to someone else doing something slightly different but related, where you could be mutually supporting, and try to, try to create the ecosystem frame, because that, that creates community. That creates solidarity, community, um, self-help over an extended geography, and it's been our experience that that actually works. So I would say that in DC, uh, well, in Cincinnati, of course, we talked to the, um, the, the city authorities and, um, and we got buy-in because what's worse than dilapidated housing that either lives, that either leads to a crime zone or just leads to you know, a neighborhood going, it's, it's like the vicious race to the bottom. So if you want to start, reverse that cycle, you start with housing and all of a sudden, you know, everything gets better. People start taking care of their home before they own it. In Cincinnati, we have an example of people, uh, we did one of these units in a very bad neighborhood. And, you know, some of the people selling drugs in the corner were amazed that people were coming up and sweeping the corner where they operated. And gradually they left because it was too clean. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And so, and so this, this renting partnership is started by people of color. And it is hugely successful. And it, it's called Renting Partnerships. Renting partnerships. Yes, ma'am. Renting. Sorry, my, I need to get my words out there better. Renting, renting Partnerships. And it comes under the Cincinnati Union Cooperative Initiative. And Marjorie and Alice are the two women heading it up. And they'll love to talk to you about it. Sir. It's fairly to, it's easy to see how if a cooperative is doing well and generating profits, how the profit is distributed. But the other side of the coin is, is the risk of potential failure. So I'm wondering how that's dealt with in the Mondragon model. How do they mitigate the risk of you know, business failure? Um, do people have, you know, are people having to pay back debts that their business incur incurs um, just like they get the, the profits when it, when it does well? How, how does that actually work? So, um Ownership has two sides, when things are going well and when things aren't going well. And the definition of solidarity, we all have a different def definition of solidarity. My definition of solidarity is if I lower my salary voluntarily to help you, my competitor, because you compete with me in some area, let's say, to help you because you had a bad year, and I'm depriving myself of money I could be keeping from the fruits of my labor and profits I could be getting at the end of the year to help you, even though I know you'll be in my face as soon as you get well because you're a competitor. And I'm doing this because we're part of the same ecosystem and because I know that one year can happen to me and you'll do me the same favor. That's solidarity. So when we had the Fagor uh, bankruptcy that I talked about, everybody in Mondragon voluntarily voted to reduce their salary 1.5% and contribute another 50 billion euros, 50 million euros to plus up the rainy day fund. Um, and, you know, you, you find people talking about it and, you know, it's not like it's an easy decision. It's never an easy decision to take a step backwards. But if you believe that the whole is so much greater than the sum of the parts, and if you believe that what goes around comes around and what's good for the goose is good for the gander, I can go on with cliche after cliche. If you believe in all that stuff, then, you know, it facilitates, it facilitates the decision. And if you believe that the community is worth more than the individual, that, you know, we're trying to do something greater than ourselves, well, then that's a decision that only hurts in a while because the solidarity makes up for it. And you know that if you're going to be in trouble, the same system is going to work for you. It's amazing to me to hear that because you usually think that 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 kind of dynamic is somehow against human nature. You hear that a lot. That this is 
somehow contrary to the way that it works, yet you have an example right here. But human nature is that way. We've just been taught the wrong uh, approach, the wrong side of our nature. Human nature, you know, uh, human nature wants, human nature walks into a dark room and turns on the light switch and nobody asks where the darkness go. They operate with the assumption of light. That's what human nature is. You mentioned a, a mandatory retirement age of 65. You can't work after 65. What happens, uh, what happens then? What, what can you do? Well, no one stops you from working. Um, you just, we just want to make sure that there's room for the younger people coming up um, to assume the positions of management and grow their careers the same way that you did, but no one stops you from working. You can go start your own cooperative business. Um, you just, at 65 is the retirement age from undergone. Um, so, but let me, let me just go back to you in the back, because um, I want to either put myself on the same hook as you or take us both off it. Um, you know, I think that uh, uh, this is America, while it disappoints us on a daily basis, it also uh, is an incredible place. Um, because we are the people that give the most uh, to charity of any population per capita. Um, and um, we're the first ones to rush into um, overseas areas of, of, of climate strife, even though we have a government that doesn't believe in climate change. Um, so, so it's not like, you know, you, there is no black and white here in terms of who's bad and who's good. It's really a competition between ourselves to see how good we can be and what system we can put together that all of us can be part of where on a volunteer basis, we agree to follow common principles, even if it hurts, because our belief in the system is bigger than the pain we may be experiencing because we had a bad, a bad year or a bad month or our industry is going out of business. Um, and, and again, Mondragon, you know, people look at Mondragon um, as this example, but I think if you talk to the people of Mondragon, they're not proselytizers, you know? They're not going out and saying, look at us, look at me, I've got the right answer. They, they're not mega church preachers. Um, uh, they say, um, look at my example. But matter of fact, there's a lot of people in Mondragon who believe that Mondragon could only happen in Mondragon because of, you know, the Basque culture, the solidarity, um, what happened after Franco, and a lot of people that criticize the work that we're doing with One Worker, One Vote, some very famous people in the city, by the way, um, they say, well, you know, you guys are smoking dope because, you know, you can't, that was Mondragon, you can't, you can't replicate it. And the answer is we're not trying to re replicate it. We're trying to eclectically take bits and pieces of it that are transportable and localize it. But we're not trying to replicate it. We have... We have no illusion about the fact that we can just pick up Mondragon. And I remember in the 2008 Great Recession, we were getting like 65 calls a week from people in places like Buffalo saying, could you bring Mondragon here? We really need to, and, you know. That was one of those conversations where you either spend a year on the conversation or you spend a second on it because you have to get to the truth of things. So what we're doing in Cincinnati, we have the Cincinnati Union Cooperative Initiative. We have the Dayton Union Cooperative Initiative. We have the LA Union Cooperative Initiative. We're forming the New York City Union Cooperative Initiative in the Bronx and Brooklyn. All these different things are happening, working with over 30 different unions. We're launching profitable working cooperatives everywhere. We're not launching them. We're supporting the people that are launching them. Um, they're the local neighborhood stars. We're just, you know, the cheerleaders or part of the catalyst. We have an expression in One Worker, One Vote, which I think is very important. It says, not the oyster, not the pearl, but yes, the grain of sand. So we're the grain of sand. The other people can decide the oyster and the pearl thing. That's fine, but we're into being the grain of sand because it's that little grain of sand that's the catalyst that itches and scratches and causes the secretions that allows the pearl to form. And that's our humble of service role. And it's a useful role. And a lot of people are doing it you know, making less than 24K a year and putting their whole lives into it of all ages. And that is a humbling, that's a humbling thought because we, we don't realize how privileged we are. Um, but people much less privileged than we are are doing so much that 
way I look at it is we don't, we don't have a choice. Um, so, can you t- talk a bit about unions and, and Mondragon's relationship to to unions and and how the things that usually unions do would be dealt with under Mondragon? So Mondragon doesn't have any unions, but we have that social committee I talked about that sort of operates like one that gave us the entry into our union co-op model. So if if you look at the worker owner as a social phenomenon, the worker owner is really two things. The worker part of the worker owner wants the highest possible salary and benefits that he or she can negotiate. And the owner part of the worker owner wants the best stock price. And that is a conflict. And my point is, it's a great conflict. And we think everybody should experience it. And we want to make sure that nobody is denied the opportunity to experience that conflict. And not just once, but every single day, day after day after day, because how you resolve that conflict, that determines your professional freedom, your self-actuation, your growth. You get to make those decisions and you get to live by those decisions. Accountability, responsibility. I'll tell you a story. We were helping, um, well, Communication Workers of America, local 7777 in Denver, uh, headed by an amazing woman named Lisa Bolton. Uh, Lisa kind of looked like someone's grandmother on a rocking chair knitting, uh, you know, hot, hot pads until you crossed her, and then she'd clean your clock. I mean, basically, clean your clock. Totally incredible organizer, nicest person in the world, tough as nails. Um, And she was organizing um, uh, immigrants from West Africa uh, who decided that they wanted to start their own taxi union cooperative. And you've read this story about Denver. It's called Green Taxi Union Cooperative. It's a true story. Um, and the reason it is with these immigrants, they came from Somalia, Senegal, West Africa. They were educated. They were teachers. They were doctors. They emigrated um, to Denver. And they said taxis. And they chose taxis because uh, they thought, well, our culture says that we need to spend a lot of time around our clan, our family, our tribe. Um, and taxis, you know, the hours, you can make, kind of make them up and they'll give us the opportunity to do that. Boy, were they wrong. And so when they came here and they experienced the lifestyle of the three medallion companies operating in Denver, they were working 16 hours a day, cars were breaking down, they had to tithe over like, I don't know, 35% a week. And they came to the conclusion, well, if this is the American dream, it sucks, basically. And they actually said, I think we can give you a better example of the American dream. And so they designed it. They decided that they were going to um, own their own taxi company. They were going to make it a cooperative and they were going to affiliate with the union. Now the union, it took them three years to fight city hall, state government, all the rules, but they finally got there. And, um, uh, and then they had to go through one, one committee of a Republican led uh, Senate committee. And, um, I was in DC and, uh, the union people that were running this hearing, uh, I got this, I got this phone call saying, "We've just been told by the chairman that we can't use the words labor, union, solidarity, co-op in our presentation. Could you help us put something together?" So we said yes, and we wrote back, "Self-reliance, bootstrapping." individual responsibility, (laughs) civic equity, giving back to society. And and then we heard nothing. And we got very alarmed. And uh, so finally, uh, I got a hold of Lisa. I said, what happened? She said, well, your text arrived just when it was our turn to speak. So I just grabbed the phone and read the words right there out loud in front of the chairman. And he said, I like those words. There's no problem there, and it passed unanimously. <laughs> so the lesson is words matter, vocabulary matters, and in this country, a lot of the things that we get hung up in are the words that we use. If you go to the Department of Labor and you talk about worker-owned businesses, they'll look at you like you're a crook. 
they're not used to that vocabulary. They are wedded to the struggle between bosses and workers. That's, they totally understand that struggle. But if we're going to evolve, if we're going to be as free as the technology we carry around and evolve, we've got to free ourselves from yesterday's vocabulary so that it no longer limits us. You know, um, this year in August, we had a huge victory thanks to um, U.S. Senator Kristen Gillibrand, Democrat of New York, who passed the Main Street Employee Ownership Act. Um, first, you know, most important uh, legislation in, I guess, 20 years or so. And it, it, it did, did one thing. It opened up SBA loans, well, the process of, you know, for cooperatives. And now we want to extend it to the hybrids, worker co-ops, union co-ops. Um, and this is really important because um, it, it broached the argument of, well, we no longer have to, you know, ask the question, who's the investor, i.e. the owner of the capital? We can now handle the question of, there may be 20 of you or 30 of you. Um, and of course, a lot more work is needed. This is just step one. But if we keep pushing in this direction, we will find a much more democratic way of using the government's capital, taxpayer financed, to fund worker cooperatives. And let me give you another example that's near and dear to my heart because it's one of our one worker, one vote goals. Um, and I've had my fights with the lawyers. So one of the things that, if you just extrapolate, one of the things I most hate about our, our, our detestable immigration system is its oligarchy inequality. So we have something called the EB-5 visa, where if you have $500,000, never mind how you got that money, you can buy your place at the head of the line. In other words, it's about as undemocratic as one can get. So my question very simply is, well, okay, if you can do that, why can't I take an immigrant, you know, union worker co-op and count the value of that co-op by all the people in it Describe them a value and let them have the same place in the line. I mean, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Why can't we start thinking like that? The question is, we have to start thinking like that. Um, and the Main Street Employee Ownership Act is just a first step, but there's many steps to take. These steps are possible, even, even in today's you know, polarized environment. That passed in August on a bipartisan basis. Who knew? Nobody thought that would be possible. So in every thunderstorm, there is a rainbow. And back to Cincinnati, the reason why renting partnership works is because they, don't, they always travel with the ecosystem. And the ecosystem are bankers, lawyers, accountants, politicians, faith-based people, community people, workers, bosses. Everybody fights to be in the photo now uh, because they're all, they all know they need each other. Um, and there's every strand of every population in Cincinnati when they hold their events. It's amazing. So that's what we have to replicate in other places. Yes, ma'am. One of the members of the crowd had been to Mondragon in, I think, 2014 or so. And when she was there, she noted that there, one of the issues was you know, with the larger population of people retiring and the retirement age of 65, that there were a lot of people um, in need of old age care and, and, and those kinds of things. And Mondragon had actually set up facilities where they hired a doctor and a nurse and a janitor and, and that these would be cooperative facilities. So she wondered uh, if, if Michael could give a bit of an update as to how these cooperative old age care homes uh, were, were doing. It's exploding. Wow. It's exploding. I think they have 40 centers like that. And typical Mondragon, when they find, they find that when it works, they've now started a cooperative called Gerodan that specializes in building furniture for the elderly. <laughs> and I'm sure they'll figure something else. They've, I'm sure they figure, you know, um, um, <laughs> we now have, um, we now have our, uh, someone was explaining to me, we now have, we, we build defibrillation kits um, we now play, we now, uh, have them on, on, on electric bicycles, um, so that you can deliver them all around the city without traffic. I mean, y you know, once you start thinking about what's possible and the people make their decision, the people usually know what works, just need to listen to themselves, to each other. 
Next question, sir. One of the things that I think needs to be discussed as, as part of the co-op uh, discussion is the changing nature of work. And so this question asks specifically, how does Mondragon look at the, the changing nature of work through automation and other labor-saving and, and time-saving devices? Right. So, um, great question. Um, so, so I was invited to speak in Vienna um, at something called the, the Innovation for Policy Institute at a, at a big European event, an EU event, called uh, the Digital Future of Work. And I was the only American there because of our union co-op approach. It was funded by Austria's Labor Party, uh, labor unions. Um, and, but they had VCs, they had you know, Mercedes, BMW, Shell, all the major European companies were there, very high level. They had four EU ministers. It was an amazing event. And we did nothing but discuss this. Um, and when it came time for me to talk, I told them something that Mondragon learned in Finland. Remember, the trick is to be eclectic. There's not one place where the truth comes from. The truth is an equal opportunity employer. You just have to eclectically grab it and use it, right? So in Finland, the taxi driver, we always talk about disintermediating the taxi driver and the bus driver and the truck driver and all drivers. But in Finland, the taxi driver um, does a number of things. He or she will um, clip your garden, pick up your kids after school, walk your dog. They'll turn the dinner on. Uh, they may do a little sweeping, cleaning. They iron a few clothes. And oh, by the way, they also drive the taxi. <laughs> so, so, so there will never be a robot or an algorithm that will disenfranchise that taxi driver because they have done one thing, which is the key to this whole conversation. They have repurposed the human being back into the center of the equation. So what we need to do when people talk about, and, and, and listen, in the DC debate, has really left me cold because all the think tanks are trying to compete on what is the future. And, and none of them mention ownership. And it really frustrates me. Why don't they mention ownership? Ownership, you know, I remember um, uh, talking to the Reverend Jackson uh, in about 1989 at some DLC event. And he told me two things. He said, it's the rising tide that lifts the boat, but you have to make sure that everybody has a boat. And, you know, and I started complaining about the myth of Sisyphus. Do you remember the myth of Sisyphus? Well, does anybody here not know what the myth of Sisyphus is? Okay, there's nothing wrong with that. I can't even say it, Sisyphus. Well, the gods condemned Sisyphus to push the rock up the mountain. The rock gets to the top of the mountain. It falls down again. Sisyphus goes to the top of the mountain, goes to the bottom, pushes it back up. So uh, philosophers and creative people around the world have always said, why does Sisyphus do it? Well, the real answer, according to the gods, is in mythology. He's condemned to do it, but people take it much, much further. What Jesse Jackson told me was, just be glad you have a rock. <laughs> Which, you know, it still makes a lot of sense to me. So when we repurpose the human being back in the center of the equation, all of a sudden, everything else makes sense. The problem is that the people are preaching creative destruction in our business schools don't want you to do that. The people that are telling you to sell all your rights and privileges to some mega data platform so that then they can use you as a commoditized advertising brand, you know, you know, don't want you to do that. So you have to organize as communities around specific industries and repurpose the human being back into the center of the equation. Once you do that, AI, robots, what comes next, Star Wars, Enterprise, you know, it'll all make sense. Sir. So you've talked a lot about the way that Mondragon has done it, which is basically starting from the ground up and doing sort of uh, creating co-ops and creating co-ops and creating co-ops. One of the things that Democracy at Work DC was looking at, and amongst other things, is actually converting businesses. So looking at people who might have a business and want to give it to workers because they don't have kids that want to take it or something like that. So what is the position of, of Mondragon and, and of you, Michael Peck, in particular, on the issue of, of converting already owned businesses into cooperatives? So conversions. Everybody's read the literature. It's out there. A lot of people are putting it out. 
NCBA Clusa, one of the best. Um, you all know about the silver tsunami. You all know 20,000 industries a year because of the baby boomers. The industries won't, they don't have anywhere to go because the family doesn't want it. Uh, the CEO, he or she is retiring. Um, they like to leave it to the workers, maybe, uh, but they need a financial vehicle. They need the workers to organize. Something needs to happen. So the idea is let's convert the enterprise uh, from a traditional enterprise to some form of ownership, whether it's a cooperative, a procurement cooperative, a shared services cooperative, a worker cooperative, a union cooperative, um, a hybrid model cooperative. Why not? Uh, so a lot of people are trying to do that. And one worker, one vote. We have teamed up with, and it was on our, we have an advisory, we have 10 co-founders, and we have six uh, national advisor, advisory board members that are heads of unions or former heads, and very blessed to have these people with us. Um, Bob King, who is the international president of the United Auto Workers, commonly known as the man who saved Detroit, um, because he set the stage for the Obama negotiations that did uh, save the automobile industry then. Um, uh, he introduced me to uh, one of the top three global management consultancies on a very high level, an executive committee level, and we've partnered now uh, to look at conversions. And this is fast. We wrote an article in Harvard Business Review, which came out in August. Um, it's free. <laughs> um, that wasn't a plug. I'm just saying we wrote it together. Um, and also with Ivan Zugasti from Mondragon. Um, who heads up social transformation, the three of us. And what's interesting about this article is not the fact that we wrote it, but the fact that they, the top three global management consultancy with $4 billion a year in annual revenues, is that they participated. Because by putting themselves on the record in front of the world, they were saying that they actually believe this is mainstream and that this has come to roost here. The chickens are roosting. And they are. So... You have a choice. You can either set up your capacity and wait for the manna to fall from heaven or grab the low-hanging fruit, and those are good, good approaches. Or you can go and drive the argument in the boardrooms, in the C-suites, in the investor halls, and make that argument too. And the answer is you need to do both. And in One Worker, One Vote, we uh, like um, talking back to power and changing the power paradigm. That's part of the our union culture. Um, we're a hybrid, again, cooperatives and unions, Mondragon principles. Um, so we're taking that approach. And um, we're uh, busy identifying possibilities. We're focusing first on the automotive sector. So to answer your question, I think a conversion is difficult, but it's always easier than a startup. The startup is the hardest thing to do. A conversion is easier. If you're going to create an ecosystem, you want to have some startups and you want to have some conversions. Um, but remember how Mondragon started. Mondragon started by education. Education means culture. Everybody leaves the cultural thing for last. It's one of my biggest peeves. The cultural thing is the hardest thing to get. You can have the business, but if you don't have the culture, the business won't sustain. And if the business is not sustainable and you have the culture, the culture can save you. So how do you get the culture? You get the culture through education. That's what the priest showed us with this school. Um, so we have to, and right now, show me, show me a college or a university with an MBA program to um, manage and work in cooperatives. MIA. So there's some, there's some green shoots happening around the country. There's an amazing professor named Rebecca Henderson at Harvard Business School. She teaches a course called Reimagining Capitalism. She wrote a case study on One Worker, One Vote and Mondragon in 2015. Um, there's other people too. And we're working to develop um, something at Southern New Hampshire University. And then in One Worker, One Vote, we've teamed up, well, our Cincinnati operation has something called Co-op U. Um, and in, in New York City, uh, the uh, CUNY Law School, uh, they have the clinic, the Community Economic Development Clinic, led by this amazing woman, uh, Professor Carmen Huertas. And they've d we've developed a, a learning by doing curriculum at the community college level, which we're launching, which has been launched. It's, it's two, two years. We've launched two full semesters of it, and it'll go live in January. So these, these curricula exist, and I guess curricula is the plural of curriculum, right? 
I mean, it's like forum and fora, right? Anyway, it's very tricky. Um, but anyway, it's, it's education. And you need to have, the answer is always concurrency. You need to have the education at the same time you're doing everything else. Um, and in Cincinnati, what do we do? We, um, we use the great game of business. We use open book budgeting. Uh, the teams come in once a week and go over their, uh, their businesses, their projections. I mean, it's hands-on. The number one equity for worker cooperatives is sweat equity. And people are you know, enamored of the democratic possibilities. They're enamored of the freedom possibilities. They're a little bit less enamored of the amount of time and the 24-7 commitment you need to put into it to make it happen. The reason why Cincinnati's successful, and they are successful, they started with nothing. These are working class, poor people from over the Rhine, which is one of the toughest districts in Cincinnati. Um, the reason why they're successful is because they work seven days a week. You could see them on the weekends working. They've now built an entity that has an annual budget of $361,000 a year. That doesn't sound like a lot, but it's huge compared to nothing. Um, and $361,000 can do a lot of good in Cincinnati. For their food desert store, Apple Street Market, which is going to be opening in the fall, they raised $3.4 million from the city and from local families. So this, this is what you have to do. It's pure organizing, and it's door-to-door, -door, it's retail. But if you can do this, and you have a business plan and a feasibility plan, and you have good management, and you have the principles, and you borrow, you learn the practices, and you have the training. If all those things happen, you can have a functioning worker cooperative. But all those things happening are required for anything you're going to do in life. So there's no, there's no mystery there. You have to do all of those things all the time, everywhere, um, if you're going to find, you know, joy in work. I will say one thing about joy in work. Um, you know you've crossed the, the threshold when work is no longer work. It doesn't mean you don't put in your 12, 14 hour day. It means you don't think of it as work. You think of it as mission. So you may be exhausted and you may be frustrated, but you don't have any question about why you're getting up in the morning and why you're doing what you're doing. And that is, that is an uplifting feeling. That is, that is a liberation feeling. Yes. As a final question, I'm wondering about Mondragon's, I guess, political position and, and political orientation. I mean, I think one can pr probably guess as to what uh, its positions are and things like that. But I'm curious, you know, in the United States, obviously, the, there is no player like Mondragon. And, and the big corporations are these giant for-profit corporations. And so I'm wondering, they obviously in, in influence government in, a lot, in, in their own way. And I'm wondering what kind of role Mondragon plays. It, does it influence these kinds of things? And, and how does it relate to the Catalan independence struggle and, and other hot button political issues in Spain, like the Indignados and, and other things that, does it connect with those? Does it say, does it stay aside from those? I mean, I think obviously its role already is, is political just in the way that it's organized, but I'm wondering if it is more proactively uh, engaged in the other forms of, of political process. So since this is being recorded, this is one of those answers uh, that are career defining. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so that's okay. So let me, let me uh, tell you my view on that. First of all, Mondragon as an entity is apolitical. It was formed away from governments. It wasn't formed with the governments. It was formed independent of governments. Self-reliance, that's why their own bank, their own university, their own social mutual. If you retire from Mondragon, and Spain has an amazing social security system that, by the way, the rest of us would literally die for to have, Mondragon has four percentage points better. Um, so, so the whole, now, you, 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 some, you, you, they receive all sorts of government delegations, um, and uh, they'll work on projects in the public sector and the private sector, but it's one worker, one vote, everybody their own politics. There's no 
one political approach, and Mondragon as an entity is an apolitical entity. Um, it stands for the 10 Mondragon principles. Those are its ideology, its reason for being, and I'd say its religion probably is the religion of cooperativism um, with uh, the Catholic, uh, sort of the worker justice peace type of Catholicism in the background because that was the tradition that Jose Maria Arith Mendireta came from. What Mondragon does in the rest of the world is it acts as the best corporate citizen it can obeying the laws of the country in which it operates. No more, no less. Sir. You know, I think it'd be fair to call solidarity a, a political act in and of itself. And so I'm wondering what the workers are able to do or what organizations they're a part of that enhances or facilitates the kind of social and cultural solidarity that you that you mentioned. Well, if, if you allow me to say this, you're coming from a U.S. context. Solidarity is a political act because we have none of it. But when solidarity is the meat and, the meat and potatoes of your culture, it's like breathing air. You're not usually counting how many breaths you take in a minute. Um, so when solidarity is built into your culture, then you practice it. You don't have to struggle to practice it or fight to practice it. You practice it because it's being practiced all around you and you can see the costs and the benefits. When you have no solidarity, which is what inequality produces, which is why the growing inequality of this country is a solidarity killer, then the fact of somebody doing something for somebody else becomes, you know, four million Twitter hits and we're so amazed that something can happen when in any other more normal culture or more generous culture, it would be an act that was a good act, but like so many other good acts. So I think that, you know, we have to solve the solidarity deficit that's in our culture. We have to go back to the shared civic experience, to a whole new societal uh, definition of what democracy means, of what freedom means, um, and our relationship to each other in our country. And it has very little to do with wealth and it has a lot to do with opportunity. Um, whenever you talk and focus on opportunity, equal opportunity, you find that solidarity is a natural outgrowth of that. And yes, we have to do more to support organizations like unions, because even though unions are not perfect either, and all of us, especially people of color, can talk about what the buildings and trades and their communities did to them, not all unions are the same. And the progressive unions are the bastions of, of where solidarity still remains in this country. You know, right now this country is all about creating gated communities and solidarity breaks down those walls. And I think that um, we have to be stronger, we have to be strong enough so that outside forces don't divide us against one another. And sometimes, you know, I, I always refer to the divine left um, and the unreconstructed right. Um, in the divine left, we tend to say, well, it's not perfect, therefore I'm going to attack it. Um, it may not be perfect. It most definitely is not perfect. But it is better than something different or less. So we have to, we have to realize that progress is incremental. In one work or one vote, we are not swinging for the fences. We are aggregating the singles and the doubles. Because when you aggregate the singles and the doubles, it allows you to get to a tipping point. And when you get to tipping points, then you can ex succeed exponentially and more people become aware. But this is a direct person. This is Johnny Appleseed or Joanne Appleseed. This is going around and seeding things continuously, relentlessly. This is organizing, but it's also telling stories. When people say what kind of business you're in, I always say, I'm in the tire creation business. And they go, what? And I say, yeah, I'm in the tire creation business because people need tires to kick. People have to kick the tires to, to, so that they can feel that this is real. Once they feel this is real, once they can see a union co-op in Denver, in Cincinnati, in Buffalo, 
in Seattle, in Madison, Wisconsin, in Austin, Texas, all these different places where these things are cropping up now, uh, then they can kick it and it becomes real to them. And they say, well, if they did it, why can't I do it? And that's the way it starts. The answer is, absolutely, you can do it. So I would just like to say it's Monday night. This is, you are an amazing group of people. Please get involved with One Worker, One Vote. Please start union co-ops and conversions and worker co-ops and other hybrid models. Uh, the, the, the emphasis is on hybrid. America is a hybrid nation. Hybrid is what we do best. Anybody who tells you hybrid isn't good, don't listen. Thank you very much, Sinar. Thank you. All right, that was a presentation by Michael Peck, the U.S. delegate for Mondragon, the largest cooperative organization in the world. So I hope you enjoyed that conversation. If you're interested in the work of Democracy at Work, check out democracyworkdc.com. Uh, you can check out uh, Mondragon. Just a quick Google search will get you all the information you need. Do check out Michael Peck's One Worker, One Vote. And if you are interested in learning more about uh, this podcast, check out sensiblesocialist.com. And if you're interested, throw us a few dollars on Patreon. All right, we're going to get uh, a lot of more interesting interviews and, and whatnot in the coming weeks. So stay tuned and I'll see you later. Thanks. <laughs>